Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone in the room, as well as those watching online, to the launch of the 2023 edition of the Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment. My name is Lynn Kwok, and I'm Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security. I'm also co-editor of the dossier. I'll be your chair for this session. It's a special occasion of sorts. This marks the 10th in the series of the dossier, and its publication also coincides with the 20th Shangri-La Dialogue. I'm thus particularly happy to see so many colleagues and friends with us in the room today. 10 years ago, my co-editor, Dr. Tim Huxley, who's seated to that corner, um, decided to start the Asia-Pacific Regional Security to provide fact-based analysis of some of the most important and pressing regional security issues. The chapters are written by IISS research staff, as well as invited experts, as a way to reinforce the intellectual basis for discussions at the Shangri-La Dialogue. We hope this edition, which draws entirely from IISS experts, does likewise. And for those of you who haven't gotten your hands on a copy, um, this is the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment. Now, the dossier this year draws on two, or rather examines two main themes. First, the impact of the war in Ukraine on the regional balance. And second, the challenges posed by various dimensions of China's growing power and increasingly active posture in the Asia Pacific. Before I turn to introduce the authors, there are some housekeeping matters. If you haven't done so already, please um, insert your card, your name cards, um, into the slot in front of you with the chip facing down. This will allow your name to be displayed. If you'd like to ask a question, and we will come to the Q&A portion of the, uh, uh, of the uh, discussion later, um, please hit speak on your microphone. This will illuminate the light and it'll turn green. It doesn't mean your microphone is on yet. It just means that you're in the queue. So I'll have you in front of me here on my monitor. Um, if you're called upon, um, your light will then turn to green, uh, to, to red, which means you are live and anything you say then will be heard. So um, then you might then proceed to ask your question. Let me now turn to the introductions. I'm delighted to be joined today uh, by several of the authors of the Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment this year. Uh, the first author I'd like to introduce to you is seated on my far, far right, Dr. Ewan Graham. Uh, he's Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Indo-Pacific Defense and Strategy. Um, Right next to me is Nick Charles, Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security. We were meant today to have the author of the chapter on the Belt and Road, Maya Nowens. Uh, she's Senior Fellow for Chinese Security and Defense Policy. We were meant to have her here today. Unfortunately, um, she will only be here later this evening. Fortunately, however, we do have her twin sister, um, Vela Nowens, uh, who recently joined the IISS Asia office as Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Indo-Pacific Defense and Strategy to speak in her place. Um, I did wonder about whether or not I should tell you guys, um, but I decided full and frank transparency should be the order of the day. So this is Vela. <laughs> um, and next to Vela is Robert Ward. Robert does not have a twin brother, so that's actually Robert. <laughs> Um, he's J Japan Chair and Director of Geoeconomics and Strategy. And finally, next to him is Dr. Shona Lung. She's Associate Fellow, Southeast Asian Politics and Foreign Policy. Um, let's now turn to Yuen. Yuen, you wrote a chapter with James Crabtree, Executive Director of the IISS Asia Office, who's back there, you can't miss him, tallest man in the room. Um, examining the war in Ukraine and the Asia-Pacific balance of power. How do you think the war in Ukraine has affected relations amongst the major powers involved in Asia's security? And do you see any implications for the Asia-Pacific regional security order? Uh, thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And, and um, welcome to the beginning of the 
uh, Shangri-La dialogue uh, process. Um, as you've said already, this was a, a, a co-authored um, chapter, so I'm, I'm not um, uh, pretending to be responsible for the, the whole output. It was very much a joint effort between myself and James. But putting my own um, spin and interpretation on, on, your, on the answer to your question, I, I would classify it in two ways, that there is an indirect effect uh, and there are direct effects uh, of the war in Ukraine. We're a bit, bit over a year in now, and I think there's also been uh, some evolution within that uh, within that that period, given the the ebbs and flows in the in the conflict itself, both on the battlefield and and uh, diplomatically. I think the indirect effects uh, are really the more significant ones, uh, which may sound counterintuitive, um, but what I mean by that is it's really the demonstration effect at the at a global level, uh, that major power uh, conflict uh, is, is real and um, has happened uh, in, in Europe in circumstances that even up to the invasion, eve of the invasion, uh, were widely uh, disbelieved, um, even on the basis of, of uh, sound uh, intelligence uh, briefings by, by Western governments. And I think that the... Uh, the way that the, the war has unfolded uh, it works two ways. Both from a, a warning point of view, the fact that uh, invasions can still happen and happen uh, uh, against all seeming common sense is, I think, something that um, all countries have to take into account uh, regardless of whether they feel they are directly affected by uh, Russia in their calculations. And that's reverberated glo globally, um, but within Asia, I, I think there has been uh, a very keen uh, eye on developments uh, in, in Ukraine, right down to the tactical level. But I think at the sort of strategic level, the other lesson that comes through is the fact that... Uh, more than a year into the conflict, uh, we have um, still Ukraine fighting uh, and uh, uh, prospering as a state in, in many ways, actually strengthened as a state, I would argue, as a result of the conflict. Uh, and that provides a, a positive lesson to the dangers of, of, um, uh, of great power conflict and predatory behavior by uh, states that have um, revanchist designs on their neighbors um, by having very bravely uh, fought and survived. And uh, we have the living proof of that with the, with the presence of um, Ukraine's defense minister here for the Shangri-La dialogue itself. And I think that is the really significant uh, lesson. And it's one that countries in the region may uh, absorb and apply unevenly, uh, and I think in Southeast Asia, maybe is uh, felt it's felt more indirectly. I think uh, there's been a very uneven acceptance of the importance of the Ukraine example. It is very far away, after all, um, but elsewhere in the in the region, we actually had again a very uh, pertinent reminder delivered by the, the Japanese Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Kishida last year that uh, East Asia's tomorrow, um, uh, Ukraine could be East Asia's tomorrow, drawing a direct uh, linkage. That linkage, of course, is not mechanical or, or hydraulic in any sense. Therefore, I think sort of simplistic uh, uh, read across from the um, invasion of Ukraine to a potential invasion of Taiwan uh, is probably overfreighting the the example, but clearly uh, there is a direct uh, uh, connection made from that demonstration effect of um, both the fact that major power conflict is a real uh, risk and possibility, but also the corresponding um, counter counterpoint that um, the temptation to a short quick, decisive war on the, on the uh, part of authoritarian governments has been proved to be a mirage in this case. And I think that's a very welcome and useful 
example that the global community at large can absorb, uh, but here in Asia, uh, given the uh, unsettled security in environment uh, that increasingly pervades. And then briefly, the, the direct uh, uh, influences of the war, as I say, I think are, are lesser in, in importance, but still significant uh, in that we do have countries in the region that have provided military uh, and other forms of aid to Ukraine. Uh, Australia being, I think, the obvious one in, in terms of its direct assistance, uh, but also um, Japan, Korea, and others having provided um, humanitarian assistance that's still significant in scope. And the biggest question, I think, that overhangs this uh, is what are the implications for the region of a closer strategic relationship between China and Russia? Uh, and in that sense, the war, I think, has acted as a geopolitical accelerant uh, and one uh, that I think uh, portends uh, uh, a rather concerning outlook uh, if, it, if the trajectory is maintained. And I say that uh, mindful of the fact that China is not in lockstep with Russia and over Ukraine. We have seen um, differences uh, clearly emerge. But over time, I think the, the relationship has been shown to be uh, stronger uh, and the clear evidence, I think, was delivered uh, after President Xi's visit to Moscow earlier this year. Thank you, Ewan. Um, you, you mentioned um, China and Russia, and also the fact that um, they're not in, uh, uh, China might not be in lockstep with Russia. Um, do you think China's position has been strengthened or weakened as a result of the war? Because notwithstanding the fact that um, China and Russia might not be one, they are perceived by one, and will that perception alone uh, turn at least the Western world more and more against China, therefore making it, putting it in a weaker position? I think it certainly poses a dilemma to the Chinese leadership in that they clearly uh, do not want a chaotic situation to unfold in, in Russia uh, in which um, you know, President Putin is, is uh, um, removed from power and uh, Russia is a nuclear-powered state. Of course, uh, all countries would be, I think, uh, mindful of the risks uh, in that scenario. But um, uh, President Putin was in China shortly before the invasion and there was a declaration of a no-limits partnership. So um, I think uh, Putin has asked a... Uh, a question of China to what to what end uh, that no limits partnership um, will withstand the pressures of of the war we I think there's a lot that China can do still to support Russia support short of of supplying it on the battlefield and we don't see evidence of that uh, coming to pass I think that's significant that that threshold uh, has not been crossed although there have been warnings about increased uh, levels of, of supply. Um, but we see, I think, in other senses, the great irony from Russia's point of view, if this was a war that was fought really about the, uh, the reassertion of, of its great power status and um, imperial uh, designs, uh, the outcome in terms of the Russia-China relationship is that in economic terms, certainly, uh, Russia has been very much exposed as the weaker partner uh, and one that is increasingly reliant on China across the board for its economic uh, support. That, um, you could say, is a gain from Beijing's uh, point of view in, in absolute uh, terms. Uh, but clearly there's a, a great deal of rather unsavory reputational baggage that uh, attaches to uh, a war that is being fought as mercilessly uh, with the uh, targeting of civilian populations, as is the case, uh, and also the fact that there has been no clear, quick victory, as was expected. I think if if um, Putin had achieved that within three weeks or four weeks or or even a little bit longer, uh, China might have um, held its nose and but been quite prepared to live with the outcome. The outcome uh, now looks distinctly uh, negative for for Russia. Uh, even if there is eventually some compromise that is uh, found, uh, this is clearly not the course of, of action that uh, 
uh, either Beijing or, uh, or Moscow would have wanted. And if I understood you correctly, um, you mentioned earlier that the, uh, the possibility of a quick, short war has been shown to be a mirage. Does that then um, reduce um, the chances of China taking military action against Taiwan? Or do you think there is um, an increased risk um, as a result of the t deterioration of um, international order that that might in fact happen. So Ukraine today, um, East Asia tomorrow. Well, as I said, there is no um, hydraulic linkage between mm -hmm. the two scenarios. The geography is also uh, very different. Uh, and um, in military terms, the proposition of, uh, of uh, overtaking a, uh, an island uh, uh, that is uh, you know, clearly well defended by means of an amphibious invasion or, or even a blockade is an extremely um, uh, demanding scenario. It's the, it's the hardest thing that one can uh, do in military terms, and China would be doing that from effectively a standing start in terms of, uh, of, of combat experience. So I don't think there was any enthusiasm really in, in the PLA's minds from the start to go for that all-out scenario. It would have been, uh, it would be um, asking really uh, uh, for the very worst case um, scenario to, to, to take that risk. Uh, that could only have been, that dilemma could only have been sharpened in, in um, Chinese military minds uh, since then. But of course, a lot of this is, is guessing. Uh, we don't know really what's um, the, the level of thinking. There may be an element in which uh, China um, looks at the Russian uh, incompetence on the battlefield and says, oh, well, that's, that's, Russian, that's a Russian problem. Uh, we can learn usefully from this in terms of not repeating the same uh, mistakes. Um, but I think the, um, the, the, more, the, the more dangerous risk is r rather than um, this foreshortening the, the timeline to an invasion that occurs in a, uh, you know, a, a short span of years, I think there's too much concentration on, on, on that. It's really the fact that it has sharpened the union of interests between uh, China and Russia uh, along a common anti-US, anti-Western axis. And that, again, I think was borne out in Xi Jinping's rhetoric uh, in Moscow, where there clearly was a, 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 you know, a conscious appeal to the commonality uh, of, um, of what Russia and China uh, are trying to, to do. And of course, China faces a uh, a whole raft of, of um, unfinished business, if you can put it that way, in terms of territorial disputes uh, and, uh, above all, uh, the claim over Taiwan, which is a very different scenario um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to that even faced by, by, by Russia. So I, I, I think the, um, the, the answer to your, your question is that um, uh, Despite the, uh, the, the battlefield um, in failures of the Russian army, I think there is still a lot that drives China and Russia together, and it is, uh, those drivers are not going to be uh, sh cut short by Russia's military misfortune on the battlefield of Ukraine. But the, the longer that, that Ukraine uh, fights, uh, and uh, the more that Western resolve has, I think, uh, strengthened, and that's another key point to stress here, is, is that the Western reaction, by and large, has been very firm, much firmer than people, I think, would have anticipated before, certainly uh, than the anticipation in, uh, in, in Beijing and, and Moscow. And that can only be a good thing from the, from the point of view of raising the element of risk to f adventurism in this part of the world. Speaking about adventurism in this part of the world, I think um, your your view um, about you know there not being a hyd hydraulic linkage between what's happening in uh, Europe to a possibility of Chinese invasion, I think that was also enunciated by another author who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, um, Nigel Inkster. But I would like to highlight some of the key findings of, on his chapter, because I think that's sometimes uh, missed in um, some of the discussion around China and Taiwan. 
Now, in his chapter, he says that there is no evidence. He takes the same view you, you and I believe you take as well. There is no evidence that the war in Ukraine has changed China's thinking about the time scale or methodology for a possible attack on Taiwan. Um, Nigel also notes that claims by U.S. military leaders that China may use military force against Taiwan within the next several years seems less uh, based on firm evidence rather than an assessment of when China will possess the necessary military capabilities for such an operation. So um, I think that's a point that's quite important in some of the discussions around China and Taiwan. But on the point of military capabilities, um, Nick, you examined uh, China's naval and maritime capabilities in your chapter. Um, could you provide us with a quick overview of where China's naval capabilities stand today? Thank you, Lynn, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, obviously there's been a significant transformation uh, in terms of both numbers and quality as far as the, uh, the Chinese Navy is concerned. It, it, it is widely referred to now as the largest Navy in the world, even, even by the Pentagon, perhaps for its own reasons. Um, but uh, that is very much in terms of a, a particular measure of numbers of platforms. Uh, and I think it is, is, it is worth uh, saying that Still, in terms of global capabilities, the United States Navy uh, still holds a very significant advantage, although the, the gap is narrowing. Um, there have been comprehensive uh, capability developments, and I think, I think that's key to you know, understanding the, the, the level of intent that there is in Beijing in, in, in terms of naval amb amb ambition. It, it, it's been very much across the board with, 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 a, with uh, some, some, some flagship uh, capabilities out there, not least the, uh, the arrival of these uh, major new surface combatants, the, uh, the Type 45, uh, the Type uh, 55 cruisers. Um, and, and we've seen in recent times also the filling in of some, some relative areas of weakness, like, for example, amphibious forces and the rapid introduction of, of you know, large deck amphibious ships in, in, into the into the Navy. Um, it's still focused uh, mainly closer to home uh, with some uh, long-range blue water capabilities and, and deployments that we've seen. Um, and it, I suppose the key is that it may now be on the cusp um, with particularly its ongoing and growing experience in terms of aircraft carrier operations of being able to deliver if the political in intent is there, more significant blue water deployments further, further afield. Uh, and the arrival of uh, the, the new aircraft carrier, which is a, another step uh, in, in, in capability with, 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 with catapults and arrest gear that would provide a more, more comprehensive capability. When that arrives, in, in, potentially in the next two or three years in operational terms, that will add to that. Um, but. Um, it's also the case, I think, uh, and, and I make this point, that we're, we are generally entering a new phase in terms of the naval and maritime balance and the trajectory of, of, of naval capability. Since the, since the, uh, the beginning of the, the century, we've, we, we, we had, an, I suppose, an initial phase when um, we, were, we saw uh, a significant uplift and perhaps a you know, s shift in the center of gravity of naval investment to the Asian region, particularly uh, driven by China, but it was in an era of, 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 of relatively benign uh, competition at sea and, 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 and great power competition. We then, in the middle of the last decade, really uh, saw a change and, 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 and a shift with the onset of a renewed uh, era of, of great power competition, changing the character of, of, of that um, maritime uh, domain uh, and, and the increased Chinese, Chinese assertiveness in the South China th Sea, I think, was a, a, a key, dr key driver of, of that. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the beginnings of uh, responses from the United States and its allies and partners. But I would argue that we're now moving into another uh, new phase uh, in which absolutely Chinese uh, naval developments are ongoing. Um, but we've, we're seeing a step change, really, I think, in, in terms of US, US responses. They're still grappling with the uh, challenges as far as the US Navy is concerned. But uh, in terms of you know, deployment, the injection of some capabilities, uh, a change in responses. Um, uh, but perhaps 
even more key than that is the step change we're seeing uh, as far as allies and partners are concerned and, and the coming together in a more integrated way of those developments, which I think is perhaps potentially uh, at least uh, slowing the shift of the pendulum or, and maybe even uh, moving the pendulum slightly back in terms of the naval balance in, in the region. Thanks so much, Nick. I think in, in your chapter, you mentioned the US and its allies and partners clawing back some significant advantages. Um, so I think that was a nice summary of, of, of what you just mentioned. Um, you know, of course, China's strategic challenge doesn't only come from its military capabilities, but particularly in this region, um, uh, the challenge also comes from uh, China's economic prowess and how that in itself translates into influence. There are polls done in um, the region, so the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, for instance, um, they've done a poll this year of Southeast Asian elites, and that indicates that while there has been a drop in the figure um, in the past year, or rather in this year from last year, China continues to be seen by some 60% of respondents as the most influential economic power. In comparison, only 11% view the United States as the most influential power. And I think this is an increase um, from last year, which was about 7%, but still it's relatively uh, low, all things considered. Um, I mentioned earlier that the dossier is celebrating its 10th birthday. Um, the other thing that's celebrating its 10th birthday is China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was launched in uh, 2013. I think it's um, worth uh, looking at where it stands today. For me, it's quite clear which I think is the more important, the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment or China's Belt and Road Initiative, but still nonetheless worth um, examining developments there. And I think Vela will be able to tell us um, where China stands in terms of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Is it, has it been as much of um, a game changer as it was expected to be some 10 years ago? Thank you, Lynn. Um, so, I mean, of course, you know, back in 2017, when the Asian uh, Development Bank um, stated that the Asia Pacific region would need roughly 26 uh, trillion US dollars by 2030 in terms of infrastructure investment, this offered a great opportunity for China to position its Belt and Road Initiative, which it had launched in uh, 2013, of course. Um, and since then, we saw, I think, an evolution in the rollout, of course, one that was regionally focused to one that had become global uh, very quickly. Um, since then, we've seen um, China spend uh, between one to two trillion US dollars, um, uh, according to various estimates. Um, and uh, it has, of course, uh, according to its own narrative, positioned itself very well to meet those needs in the region. Uh, particularly in hard infrastructure, but also in other ways. And that evolution is one that we have seen right up until today where we've seen one major change, which is the hard infrastructure is now being morphed into digital infrastructure and of course health infrastructure um, through the health Silk Road and the digital Silk Road over the last few years, and particularly of course most recently with COVID. We've also seen a geographical shift um, in project um, allocation uh, with a particular focus um, returning back to um, uh, China's most immediate regions, South and Southeast Asia. Um, these, of course, for China itself are key strategic and also economic um, priorities. And so it makes sense for them to, to kind of revert back to that. Has it achieved its goals? Um, you know, I think it's the, the assessment, if you read it, uh, is patchy. Um, depending on what subregion you look at, there is no even kind of application or result uh, of their um, investments. Um, they have certainly specific countries where investments have done particularly well, um, where also these have leveraged, um, you know, Chinese investments have, have been leveraged for greater trade um, uh, entry points. Um, and certainly in terms of Chinese technology as well, that has been um, positive in, in various countries. But 
again, that's you know not to say that it is a, an entirely um, obvious, holistic kind of comprehensive picture of success for China. Um, it is currently, if we look at the various projects uh, and what stages they're at, um, by 2021, um, the assessment was that 64% uh, of projects were completed, 22 were ongoing, and 14 are still planning. And that Chinese um, investment, certainly in um, hard infrastructure, really peaked in 2018. But you know, there's, we can ask what questions, uh, we can ask why really that, that was the case, and I think there's various reasons for this. Um, as born through the research. The first is, uh, of course, um, domestically in these countries themselves. Uh, we've seen you know, connectivity towards Europe, for example, encounter some political um, difficulty, but also other um, Belt and Road countries that have signed up to this, um, to this uh, initiative uh, have uh, insecure political, ethnic, uh, and security environments for which China itself still faces challenges as well. And of course, we've all seen the news, um, for example, in Pakistan, where Chinese nationals have, have been targeted. But I think we forget also that when it comes to um, the Chinese economy, you know, we tend to think of um, Belt and Road, or it is, it is, uh, I guess, um, spoken about uh, as a debt trap uh, in quite a lot of um, media analysis. Um, but that really also goes both ways. Um, so first, I think various research studies have questioned that assessment, and second of all, you know, if we look at, at Chinese investments, currently 60% of Chinese overseas loans are held in countries considered to be um, fi in financial distress. And that is when compared to about 5% in, in 2010. Um, Ukraine, uh, COVID, those have exacerbated um, China's own economic situation, but also, of course, um, the economic stability of these countries themselves, leading to um, you know, an inability for these countries to really um, financially uh, afford and continue to repay uh, these investments. Um, and we've seen also, I think, you know, another area, particularly for China, I think that was a lesson learned, was the uncoordinated um, aspect of outward investment uh, at the start uh, of the Belt and Road. Um, the question is, I guess, what next? Um, certainly um, a consolidation, as I said, of those um, projects that are still ongoing um, and those that are in planning phases. But I think also understanding now how these new initiatives that China is um, pushing forward, the, the Global Security Initiative, the Global Data Security Initiative, and also, of course, the Global Development Initiative, which are heavily targeted and, and aimed um, towards the Global South as, as another form of partnership, which China can then leverage to really build on um, the Belt and Road and the Digital Silk Road uh, investments, how that will really um, evolve over time, I think, is the next stage to look at. The other um, question to look at, of course, um, is where uh, the alternatives to China's Belt and Road um, initiative stand. So the US, Japan, the EU, these actors, actors have all launched their own infrastructure initiatives um, aimed particularly at the Asia and Indo-Pacific. Um, do they stand a chance of competing against um, Chinese um, investment, given that some of the sums involved there are relatively smaller um, to China's offerings? So I think there have been a few kind of teething problems with some of these um, initiatives. You know, there was clearly an understanding that once uh, countries became more concerned around uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the potential influence that these might have or, or discussions around dual use um, facilities, for example, that alternatives needed to be provided. Um, and we've seen a whole host, a whole host of them. I mean, you've, you've mentioned a few, Lynn. Um, you know, Blue Dot Network, um, the Build Act as well, Global Gateway of the EU, um, and then most recently the G7 um, uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. Um, and, and over time, I think we've seen um, different levels of, uh, I guess, growing levels of awareness of, of some of the challenges that some of the initial um, uh, initiatives had, had faced, you know, things around awareness. Um, do countries really understand what these initiatives are trying to do, how they access them, how much money is really behind them? And that has, of course, also been, been an issue in terms of how much funding these projects were really offering, um, how to leverage um, public-private um, partnership. Mm -hmm. That has also been, I think, a, a very um, you know, strong message in a lot of these initiatives, but not hasn't necessarily borne uh, much fruit, uh, certainly not in the, the initial um, stages. And then also, you know, starting off with concrete pilot projects to get 
get the, the ball rolling um, and to show countries um, what these initiatives can do and what they're aiming to do. Um, in total, in terms of um, the actual uh, amount of funding, of course, you know, this doesn't, you know, like for like uh, match Chinese uh, funding, um, but I think uh, it, it is an opportunity at the moment, quite um, uh, fortunately for, for these initiatives, that um, there, there is an opportunity to leverage, one, the slowdown in Chinese uh, investment, um, outward investment through its own initiative, um, and then also, of course, to maybe um, work with these countries who are in financial distress to either help renegotiate um, some of these loans with China or to offer um, some alternatives. But again, how these countries and how these initiatives select projects, um, how they approach countries as well about, about these uh, potential opportunities, those still, I think, need to be worked out. So if we listen to Nick, um, China has progressed a lot in the maritime domain, um, but the U.S. and its allies may be gaining um, some advantage, given that they're, you know, focusing their attention on it and working together. We listen to um, Verla, um, who tells us about how the Belt and Road, you know, has mixed success, um, and you know, some of the uh, U.S. allies and partners are perhaps, you know. They might have a window of opportunity for, um, for uh, at least supplementing, if not uh, providing a viable alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So, you know, not all's rosy on the strategic front for China. Nonetheless, I think the strategic challenge that China um, poses remains palpable. We see that in the U.S. national security strategy, for instance, calling China the pacing challenge. We also see that, of course, in um, Japan's recent national security strategy. Um, I think, believe this was launched or published in December 2022. And so, Robert, in your chapter with Yuka Koshino, also in this room, over there. Um, research, she's Research Fellow for Security and Technology Pol uh, Policy. Um, the both of you discussed Japan's updated national security strategy. So what are Japan's main concerns in the strategic environment? So first, happy 10th, uh, Lynn, mm -hmm. by the APRSA. Thank you. Um, a great, uh, great set of essays. Um, Japan, um, to talk about Japan, I think I've got five minutes. Uh, given how much is going on in Japan at the moment, I don't think five minutes will do it justice, unfortunately. Um, the title of, uh, of Yuka's and my essay was Japan Steps Up. But actually, I think um, a, better, uh, a better phrase would be sort of Japan in revolution, uh, almost. I, I first went to Japan as a sprightly 23-year-old in 1989. So I've been looking at Japan for over 30 years. Uh, and in my short little life, I've never seen anything uh, sort of as change as rapid uh, as we're seeing now uh, in, in Japan. Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, this is uh, what Kishida is doing. This revolution um, is based on things that uh, Abe did, Abe Shinzo did in his second premiership in 2012 uh, to 2020. So he left um, institutional and sort of conceptual legacy that uh, Kishida is now building on. Um, but what the Prime Minister uh, Kishida is doing, I think, is, uh, is giving the foreign policy activism that we saw under Abe, giving it a really important uh, security backbone. Um, if you have five minutes uh, while you're here, um, I suggest you, you do a compare and contrast of the 2013 Japanese national security strategy and the 2022 Jap you know, <clears throat> Japanese national security strategy. Um, the difference in tone of these two documents uh, is quite striking. Um, and at the beginning, uh, Japan uh, describes uh, its strategic environment as severe and complex as it has ever been since the end of World War II. Uh, and that gives you a really, I think, clear insight into just how um, concerned uh, Japan is about the deterioration uh, in its strategic uh, environment. In, 2020, in 2013, this was Japan's first national security strategy. It was, it was interesting, of course, in its own right, um, but that sort of deterioration in tone, I think, is, is definitely worth, worth noting. Um, what has triggered this? Well, none of, the, none of the factors that have triggered it will be surprising to you, but they are interrelated. Uh, and there are three of them, of course. The first uh, is rising concerns about China. 
Uh, one of the things that Abe Shinzo did pr uh, often was to emphasize just how geographically close Japan is to China, and that's an important uh, influencer in, t in terms of how Japan calibrates its relations towards China. Uh, as Nick uh, said in his piece, uh, the, growth in Chinese uh, the growth in Chinese maritime power um, has been remarkable. So China is outspending Japan uh, in terms of military kit. Japan, uh, China is also needling, uh, territorially needling Japan down in its south in the, in the Senkaku Dayu uh, Islands. Um, it is doing this on a sustained, relentless basis, and of course this gives great concern uh, in Tokyo. And, and of course, again, um, in 2022, after Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, uh, China obviously went, uh, uh, was very active uh, in terms of its, of its military exercises and so on. It lobbed some missiles into what Japan claims as its EEZ. So for Japan, uh, what's going on in China uh, with, with regard to Taiwan as well, all, all is of great, uh, great concern. And then, the, the, of course, you have North Korea, and this is a perennial uh, concern for Japan. Japan has other issues with North Korea, not least the issue of the Japanese nationals abducted uh, by North Korea in the 1970s and 1980s, which remains uh, unsolved. But in 2022, of course, again, uh, it was a record year for, for launches of missiles uh, from North Korea, and in October last year, one overflew uh, Japan. I was thinking, are there any other G7 uh, nations uh, which have also had that experience of a missile flying over their territory? Um, uh, and of course, again, with Russia, the ter this is the third factor. Um, uh, since Russia's illegal U invasion of Ukraine, uh, relations between Japan and Russia, which are neighbors up north, have deteriorated considerably. Negotiations over the territorial dispute have frozen. Of course, that means no peace treaty uh, between the two. Um, and very importantly, Japan is extremely concerned about the evolving security uh, a strategic relationship between uh, Russia and China. If you're sitting in Tokyo, this looks like it's being operationalized through things like joint aerial patrols, joint naval patrols around Japan, uh, near Japan. Yes, these are not integrated, uh, but they are politically very important signal uh, from these two, I think, uh, to Japan. So if you look, if, again, if you're sitting in Tokyo, you look to your west, uh, you see Russia in the north, North Korea in the middle, and China in the south, and you think there, you can see that there's very clearly uh, an arc of risk there. Um, a final point on this particular question, Lynn. This has been, this, this, I think this increase in concern has been one of the key factors behind the very welcome uh, rapprochement between uh, South Korea uh, and Japan over the past few months. You mentioned the rapprochement between South Korea and Japan as one response to Japan's um, in, um, worsening strategic environment. Um, what are some of the more significant uh, Japanese responses uh, to the new challenges that it faces, or the enhanced challenges that it faces? Well, I would regard the, uh, that rapprochement as, as important as some of the things Japan is doing, um, very important uh, for stability in, in the region uh, more broadly. Um, but uh, as, as you said, Lynn, there are some sort of specific uh, things that Japan has, has set out in the, uh, in the 2022 um, National uh, Security Strategy, uh, which are, um, as I said earlier, absolutely revolutionary. Um, one of the things about this, this strategy, has, was about the message of the, message of the strategy, it is in effect the formal ditching of the uh, Yoshida Doctrine. Those of you that know your uh, Japanese history will know that that is the, the sort of idea, the underpinning of policy since 1945, under which Japan sort of basically relied on the US for defense but adopt, and adopted a low posture uh, in international affairs. A key message from the national security strategy is that Japan now uh, takes prim primary responsibility itself for defense of itself as part of the sort of broader boost to uh, the credibility of the deterrence uh, effect of its alliance with the, with the US, again, through deeper integration uh, with, with the US. 
In terms of the headline items from the uh, NSS, of course, the one that, that got everyone's attention uh, was, the, was the plan to, um, was to raise uh, spending on defence from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. I think this, this involves a, an uplift in spending of about $300 billion over the next uh, five years. All this has to be done by 2027, 2028, and that would make Japan the third or the fourth largest uh, defence budget uh, globally. So quite a, quite a hefty increase in spending. Um, key elements to achieve this, um, this sort of a credible primary responsibility um, are just a few highlights here. One is to develop counter-strike uh, capability. Um, obviously, there's a caveat of, of no first use, I think, but uh, this would be a major shift from the current architecture, uh, which relies on ballistic uh, missile defense. Um, there's an emphasis in the new NSS on um, advancing Japan's cross-domain uh, capabilities, so to boost its capabilities in cyber, uh, in space, to boost the, the numbers of personnel working on cyber uh, in Japan, um, and to create a permanent joint headquarters to improve, again, cross-service uh, uh, cooperation. There's also a very important uh, strategic focus on the southwestern islands. Um, as I never tire of saying, if you stand on the the far west of Yonaguni, of Yonaguni Island in the southwestern islands on a clear day. Apparently, you can see Taiwan. It's only about 100 kilometers away. So just the proximity of Japan, of Japanese southwestern islands to Taiwan is very important. And there's a recognition, I think, the, the desire to, to boost security there, I think, is a recognition that in the event of a Taiwan contingency, uh, Japan would be very much physically uh, on the front line. Um, very, another important aspect of the NSS is boosting Japan's defense resilience, so the ability to sustain a war f a footing, Keisen Noryoku, uh, in Japan, to, to, to strengthen its defense industrial base, to strengthen its defense primes, all of that sort of need to make Japan more resilient if there was, a, if there was an issue around, around it. Um, and also, finally, mobilizing um, the full spectrum of Japanese power. In the, new, in, the, in the new NSS, there is a reference to a sort of new concept for Japan, relatively new, a comprehensive national power. And this refers to, di to diplomacy, to, to, to intelligence, to technology, all the, to, to the economy, to geoeconomics, all the elements of Japanese power which the, which the government wants to sort of bring together um, as, a, as a way to, to, to influence what goes on in the region, also to boost its, uh, its deterrence capabilities. Thank you, Robert. Um, of course, we've spoken a lot today about tensions between states, but not all tensions in the Asia-Pacific are between states. They also take place at a subnational level, um, such as that in Myanmar. Um, Shana, you write a chapter with Aaron Connolly, who's Senior Fellow for Southeast Asian Politics and Foreign Policy, also in the room today, um, he, uh, where you discuss um, the conflict in Myanmar and uh, the evolution of the conflict in Myanmar. I think what's been much talked about has been how protracted the conflict has been, but also there has been a sort of a holy grail of national elections on the horizon. How likely do you think um, uh, it will be that national elections take place this year, and will elections actually help to uh, usher in greater stability for a country that's greatly in need of uh, greater stability? Thank you, Lin, and thank you, Tim, for this opportunity. Six months after the Myanmar Armed Forces took power in February 2021, it declared that elections would be held in August this year. However, however prospects for Myanmar going to the polls look increasingly dim. Chief among these signs is that a few months ago, Junta Chief Min Ong Lang declared that Myanmar would hold a national census in October 2024. He said the census would be held to, I quote, ensure that voting lists are accurate, end quote, suggesting that this exercise would precede an election. Min Ong Lang also stated that elections would be held only when Myanmar was stable. However, the situation in Myanmar does not appear to be moving towards stability, nor has it been since the military took power. From the perspective of the Myanmar Armed Forces, Myanmar is currently being destabilized by a variety of armed groups, old and new. 
While the junta has sought, mostly unsuccessfully, to sign ceasefire deals with older ethno-national fronts, the junta has labeled new armed groups terrorists with whom it is unwilling to negotiate. Areas and peoples associated with these new armed groups have been subject to scorched earth campaigns involving airstrikes and the burning of civilian infrastructure. To most of these armed groups, it is Minong Lang's junta that has destabilized Myanmar and not resistance to its rule. In any case, research done by the IISS shows that 95% of Myanmar's townships have been affected by armed violence since the coup, albeit to different degrees and in different ways. In our chapter, Aaron Connolly and I provide a framework for understanding the multi-fronted conflict occurring in Myanmar at present. The, conf the conflict can appear confounding and opaque, but we show that there are now three types of conflict theatres in Myanmar, borderland resistance strongholds, central contestant areas, and non-aligned areas. The central contestant areas align with what is often called the Burma heartland, areas of Myanmar populated primarily by Buddhist Burma people, the basis of the Myanmar Armed Forces claims to protect the country's core from internal and external threats. And so, the conflict does not look to be petering out. Indeed, elections are likely to inflame conflict, not resolve it. For one, new armed groups formed after the coup see the current conflict as a zero-sum game. Either the junta wins or they do. Come elections, anyone who votes may be seen as participating in a sham election run by an illegitimate junta and thus be a target for guerrilla groups. Conversely, anyone who refuses to vote could be at risk of further crackdowns from the military regime. Moreover, ethno-national groups fighting against the junta, while positioned variously toward the wider resistance movement, will not have their aspirations satisfied through the ballot box. And so in the current context, by our analysis, elections will not usher in greater stability, but rather the opposite. So with that bleak assessment, I ask my next question. Um, so if, if you're expecting um, conflict to actually continue or perhaps even intensify, um, does the five-point consensus reached between ASEAN member states as well as the, uh, the leader of the junta actually achieve anything? Should we just be writing that off or is, is there some merit to that piece of paper? Thank you for the question. It is a bleak assessment indeed. Um, well, the international response to Myanmar's conflict has centered on ASEAN, which has taken a harder line towards the junta than towards Myanmar's previous military governments. Two months after the coup, ASEAN leaders and Myung Lang agreed on a five-point consensus, as you said, for resolving the situation in Myanmar. At that time, the conflict was just beginning. The junta had violently cracked down on those demonstrating against the coup, causing some protesters to turn towards armed resistance. In the two years since, Myung Lang has not upheld these commitments, indicating that he viewed them merely as an advisory. The first point in the five-point consensus is the immediate secession of violence in Myanmar. But as we've talked about, violence in Myanmar has continued. And while ASEAN has condemned individual instances of violence, such as the junta's April 2023 airstrike in Paziji village, which killed 130 civilians, the, um, ASEAN has not been able to rein in the Myanmar armed forces. Still, the five-point consensus has bridged divisions between the remaining nine member states of ASEAN. So far, we write that ASEAN countries' responses to the junta have fallen into two categories. The maritime states, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore, have favored isolating the junta, while the mainland states, led by Thailand and including Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have argued for greater engagement. Nonetheless, the five-point consensus has made it difficult for mainland states to argue for the inclusion of Minong Lang in ASEAN summits, foreign, and defense ministers' meetings, given that the junta has not fulfilled any of its terms. Therefore, although the junta's officials still participate in the work of ASEAN at a lower level, these steps amount to a de facto suspension of Myanmar from ASEAN at the bloc's most important meetings. Furthermore, it remains to be seen how Indonesia's role as ASEAN chair this year will play out. Keen to break the deadlock, Indonesia has approached the role of ASEAN Special Envoy differently. Rather than appoint its foreign minister to the role, it has created an office of the Special Envoy. Indonesia, that said, has adopted a quieter approach, seeking to meet all actors, including Myanmar's shadow government. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, uh, Shana. Uh, it, it's now come to question and answer time, um, or comments time. Uh, if you could just um, hit the button if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. I currently have one speaker on the list. Um, you need to, please, you need to be cued because otherwise um, I can't call on you and your microphone won't be turned on. Great, I see some names on the list already. Uh, so let's go with, um, Hannah Schellest, um, Big Tran, um, Brent Sadler. Uh, let's go with the, these three names first, please. Hello, Dr. Hannah Schellest, Foreign Policy Council, Ukrainian Prism. And uh, I definitely have the question regarding the first presentation about the uh, so-called war in Ukraine. Uh, don't you think that if you would formulate it differently as what it is, the Russian aggression, the consequences and the lessons for the Asia-Pacific will be not the so-called great power or mayor power conflict, but the uh, uh, very direct implications such as uh, problems for the safety of navigation, so the uh, uh, problems with the nuclear security, uh, that we can speak about the change of the Japan uh, um, security doctrine de facto because of what is happening, the change of the neutrality concept for so many countries around the world that will be more and more actual for the Asian region as well. The problems with the international organizations, the sanctions regime, that's something what we already can speak, and food security for sure. So not even something in 10 years, but what we are speaking now. And a small comment that I couldn't skip uh, because I am from Odessa, and you're writing that uh, Russians never tried to land in Odessa. I have bad news. They tried several times, both Odessa region and Odessa city itself. They just failed. But there were attempts, and uh, in terms of maritime security, there were a lot of uh, the stuff that should be learned in Asia because they can be repeated not only by China, but many other smaller nations who just have the capacity. Lynn, I think you've got me. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, my name is Big, uh, one of the yeah, Southeast Asian young leaders, uh, uh, yeah, delegates here today. Uh, so my question is for Yuan and uh, Nick. Uh, so I wonder, you know, like um, uh, the SSN AUKUS submarines uh, will not be delivered to the Australian Navy until uh, the 2040s. So until by then, I think that the quantum sensing technologies will allow coastal states to detect submarines uh, much more effectively. So I wonder, and this will be, you know, in turn, it will undermine the submarine operations. So I wonder whether the three countries of AUKUS, how will they deal with this issue? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and congratulations, Lynn, on your 10-year anniversary on the book. Um, or the, uh, the assessment. So th really two-part question. Uh, the first one really is, you know, having flipped through the book uh, this year's uh, uh, assessment, it seems to be in the last few years that there's a marked increase in Chinese military activity in East and Southeast Asia. And I'm kind of curious if that can be condensed down to something tangible, either is it a military confidence or is it something else that might be driving this increased military activity from your assessment. And then, I guess, really for you, Lynn, specifically, looking to 2024, this year has been very interesting with a lot of activities in the South and Central Pacific in this great power competition between the United States and China. Uh, what do you see as the potentials for looking at uh, dynamics changing in that region uh, in the coming years? I think I'll call on Sujan Chinoy next, please. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Sujan Chinoy. I'm the Director General of the Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses in New Delhi. Um, my question is to Graham. Uh, China uh, 
runs the risk of uh, inviting greater opprobrium uh, in deepening its uh, relationship with Russia, particularly at this stage. Uh, but is it possible that China might also see advantage in emerging as the magical interlocutor uh, for Russia uh, and use that to leverage better ties with uh, a West that is increasingly critical of China? Uh, it's managed to do this in the past with North Korea. Uh, can it do so with regard to Russia as well? Dmitry Savastopoulou. Sorry for butchering your name. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, so a question for either Robert or Yuka. You talk about Japan becoming increasingly concerned about China. Um, I'm curious, have you detected any anxiety in Tokyo about the way the US is approaching the Taiwan question? Richard McGregor. Um, thank you, Richard McGregor Law Institute. Sorry, I just got a lolly in my mouth. Um, question for Dr. Noens. Um, uh, besides or on top of COVID, what is your explanation for the rapid decline in Chinese development lending, not just in Southeast Asia, but right, indeed right around the world since 2018, 2019? Are they just taking a breather? Um, or, and would you expect to see a, a new surge? Or have we entered into an entirely new period of engagement in, in that space? I think I'll take one more question um, from one of our young leaders, Fitriani from Indonesia. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Vitriani from CSIS Indonesia. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Shunalong. Um, I would like to um, ask for your opinion in terms of how can ASEAN do better in um, managing the issue of Myanmar, um, as well as uh, how do you see the great powers can contribute in the peaceful solution of the conflict? Thank you. Shall we start with um, you and shall we start with you? There are a few questions for you. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, in the order that they were um, put to me, uh, Hannah. So um, it's good to see you here in uh, in Singapore. I'm, I'm glad you were able to attend. Um, yeah, fair point on on uh, if I got it wrong and there were attempted landings. I think the bigger point is that the landings failed and that the Russians were not able to use uh, maritime uh, power to their advantage. The maritime dimension, I think, is a particularly interesting one in terms of how it reads across to uh, this region. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine is predominantly a, a, a land-based conflict, so the, the military uh, lessons are, uh, are less pertinent for, for maritime states here, but you, you mentioned uh, important of navigation, and I did we did flag in our chapter the um, potential involvement of third, third states. Turkey, in, in the case of, of uh, Ukraine, obviously holds a, a key card with its uh, control over uh, shipping movements uh, through the Bosphorus. Um, there is no exact analog in, in the, uh, um, the Asia-Pacific, uh, but there have been sort of noises about uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, exerting its geo geostrategic position across key straits that link the Pacific and the, and the Indian Ocean to make a point to great powers if there was a move towards conflict uh, in Taiwan. Sanctions is, is, is an interesting one. I think the sanctions against Russia as a potential test case for sanctions uh, if there were to be a conflict involving uh, China um, is, is, is worthy of... of um, of greater study, we, we have a, uh, a very good analyst at the ISS, Maria Shagina, uh, who concentrates on, on this. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a very different ball game here because of the high level of integration and dependence on the Chinese economy uh, that uh, 
Uh, there have been very few who have embraced sanctions. I think Singapore is one clear standout, and Singapore did use language uh, in its initial um, response to the invasion in the UN uh, where it used the word existential. It drew a clear linkage between its security as a small state against outside ag aggression. Other countries in the region have been much less uh, um, front-footed, uh, and we have uh, the rather bizarre spectacle of Russian uh, Air Force display teams taking pl part in, in regional uh, air shows uh, close by. Um, so I think it is a very different um, I, uh, political environment. And frankly, a lot, of, a lot of countries in the region do still buy the narrative that NATO is partly to blame for this. That is an unfortunate fact of, uh, of, of life. Uh, on the second question that was put to me on, will China be able to leverage its uh, attempt to uh, be a, a, a magical interlocutor, was the phrase you used. Um, I don't see that as a, a risk until China is taken more seriously as a, a neutral party. And, and I think the cautious approach of the Ukrainian government towards the Chinese offer shows the fact that there, there wasn't much faith, I think, in, in Kyiv put towards uh, Russia's good offices. And it's, it's obviously exposed by the diplomatic support that has grown stronger over the course of the war from Beijing for, for Moscow. Um, so I think the idea of a, you know, freezing a ceasefire in place is a no-go uh, as long as the two um, sets of, of, of uh, uh, conditions are so far apart um, uh, and they have grown further apart over the course of the war. So I think it's going to be very hard for China to, to straddle that. And uh, on the, new, the um, North Korean example, well, the lesson was that the road to um, denuclearization of, of Pyongyang did not run through Beijing. That experiment was run with the six-party talks and it didn't get very far. So I don't think people will be buying that same horse twice. Nick? Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll respond, uh, I think, specifically to the SSN or the, um, the, the AUKUS question, but I'd, I'd just like to um, reinforce, if I may, on the, on the point that was raised about the, uh, the ripple effects from the Ukraine war, particularly in the maritime space. And again, that, that's very much something that uh, I, I reference in my um, uh, chapter as well, that uh, uh, for all the perspectives that one normally uh, sees on, on Ukraine, um, absolutely the, the, the maritime uh, uh, space and how it's how it's unfolded has has you know very significant ripple effects globally, but in, in, into the region in, in in terms of the the reinforcement of some of the interconnectedness that we've we've, we've talked about the uh, significance of, uh, of of sea lines of communication uh, and the potential uh, Im impact of those globally. Um, it's the reinforcement of of, of certain uh, naval um, uh, tools uh, like. Blockade, for example, and, and 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 potentially how quickly that can affect others beyond those directly directly targeted. Uh, I, I think also has has significance, and, and some of the, the the technical capabilities that have been displayed at, um, at sea uh, uh, by Ukraine uh, in terms of taking on uh, some of the traditional. Uh, uh, Russian uh, naval capabilities, um, the, the prolifer pr proliferation of some of those um, technologies, I think, have very, very much uh, pertinence in, in, in this region. Um, on AUKUS specifically, um, uh, you're absolutely right that the, 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 the culmination of, of the central uh, plank of AUKUS in terms of uh, delivery of, a, of an indigenous uh, Australian um, uh, nuclear-powered submarine capability will not see will not come to fruition uh, until uh, the, uh, the, very, uh, the very earliest, the late 2030s, probably into the into the 2040s. Um, but uh, you know, the, the the submarine element to this is a phased approach, which will which will deliver incremental um, capabilities along the path to um, to to the uh, in, indigenous uh, capability. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it will be challenging. Uh, 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 it's not a it's not a done deal, but it, it has a potentially st strategic significance, uh, no doubt about that for all for all three partners. Um, uh, underlining uh, a lot of this, uh, though, is that um, in in a sense, the subsurface uh, um, space is 
going to be one of increasing significance uh, going forward, and that's, uh, that's recognized, I think, in the, the impetus behind AUKUS. Um, but it is itself changing, and, and you're right, there has been a significant debate about uh, crude submarines and large nuclear-powered submarines and, and whether they will have a role given the, the, the development of other technologies uh, uh, in, in the um, uh, undersea environment uh, going forward. Uh, remember that AUKUS is, is uh, made up of multiple other elements in the second pillar, including the um, uh, development of further uh, uh, technical capabilities in the subsurface environment. And I think the key is that going forward, this will be uh, a mixture of, of, of capabilities that will include, include crude submarines as part of a network of, of, of other capabilities. And that is, is, if you like, part of the package, but also part of the, part of the requirement. Uh, and while there will be change and significant change, uh, the emerging technologies will not completely replace some of the capabilities that, that things like nuclear-powered submarines provide uh, uh, certain certain players in terms of their requirements. So, so it's a mix, and and we'll we'll see that you know AUKUS is 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 uh, is an evolving uh, uh, animal uh, or, or with, with with multiple parts, some of which will come together uh, more and more in the subsurface space. Um, I'll just also very quickly uh, answer an element of, of Brent's. Brent's question, at least as far as uh, the, the, the naval and maritime uh, space is concerned. Uh, I think it's a, it, it's a combination of um, ambition as far as uh, you know, developing, d d developing presence and, and, and activity um, uh, as part of a, a, a long-term plan of, 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 uh, of Beijing's naval ambition going, going forward. Um, but it also is, is, is significantly, I think, a part of um, the developing capabilities that that are um, uh, coming coming to fruition, um, and and uh, it, it, it's to some extent incremental. One could argue that in some in some cases, while the while the while the capabilities are arriving in in, in some ways sooner than um, than uh, have been expected, the actual ambition for greater sort of blue water reaching out has been slower in, in some respects than, than, than might have been anticipated. And the interesting question going forward, and I go back to the, my theme around um, the, uh, the, 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 the changing dynamic of, 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 the, of the naval balance going forward, is that uh, Beijing, I think, will adjust its plans going forward as it assesses how the responses of the US, its allies and partners um, uh, are evolving and, and how it needs to, to, to reframe potentially its its own ambitions from carrier capabilities downwards a, a, as it looks to develop in the future. Um, I think I'll turn now to Vale to continue with uh, the question that um, Brent posed. Um, so the question of the motivations behind the increase in Chinese activities. And I think um, also there was one directed to you, to you on Chinese development lending as well. So maybe I'll take them in reverse order. Um, firstly, kind of why do we see um, why did we see a rapid decline 2018 2019? Again, I think there's a shift there in the type of investments um, that that you saw being made. Um, so you know, hitting kind of peaks um, everywhere in, in that hard infrastructure and um, bracket, be it energy, transport, um, et cetera. Um, but then uh, also, you know, as I'd mentioned already, um, this issue of uh, the uncoordinated nature. Um, that, that we'd seen um, in, in China of how uh, this outward investment was taking place. Um, and over time, also, um, the kind of restrictions and, and narrowing of focus uh, of uh, outward investment on more specific and strategically um, uh, important, uh, as well as probably financially viable projects. Um, so that, I think, um, you know, uh, facilitated um, that, that slowdown. And, to a certain extent, one would imagine also market saturation, right, in the amount that we had seen going out to these countries. Um, uh, in terms of a new surge, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, as uh, stated in this chapter, I think 
for a lot of these subregions, kind of new major um, hard uh, infrastructure projects, uh, as we'd seen in, in the earlier um, iterations of the BRI, are, are probably unlikely, um, and, and that is uh, due to the the kind of evolution of some of these softer um, areas uh, of investment, be it um, the DSR or Health Silk Road. But then also, again, the Global um, Security Initiative and the Global Development Initiative in particular. Um, how those, you know, the, the details, of course, are still thin on the ground when it comes to these initiatives, but how those are going to pan out uh, in extending uh, the lifespan, so to speak, of, of the Belt and Road um, is one to watch. I think that is where we might see um, surges. Um, and then, you know, maybe to on the flip side of that for the South Pacific, it was actually interesting that um, in this chapter it noted that actually projects in the South Pacific were slow to begin with um, and uh, accelerated uh, in 2018. So almost, you know, kind of a flip side there. Um, in terms of the actual impact that that had, this chapter finds that there was, you know, minimal impact. Some countries, um, a few in particular, obviously heavily indebted to China. Um, but in terms of political, um, you know, whether that had a major political impact, uh, that's questionable. Um, the Solomon Islands, of course, recent security agreement has raised a lot of concerns, um, but we've also seen uh, a, a lack of buy-in in extending this to the broader region. So again, a mixed bag for China in terms of what it's actually achieving on the ground in that respect. Um, uh, I would say um, that in terms of you know uh, the the prospect for further investment, um, this particular chapter points towards you know the already high level um, of indebtedness in, in this region more generally, and not just to China, um, just the economic situation in and of itself. So does that you know for China that is currently in need of more economically feasible uh, investments and returns? Is the South Pacific really the number one top priority subregion that you're going to invest in? Potentially not. Again, it points more towards um, Southeast Asia in particular in that respect. But again, and I, I'll point again towards the Global Security Initiative, the Global um, Development Initiatives, those will probably be areas where China will heavily um, focus on in that part of the world. I think I'll come to Shauna next. Um, Fitriani's question in Indonesia, then after that, Robert, about um, Japan's um, possible, whether Japan's anxious about the U.S. approach towards Taiwan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Fitriani, for the really constructive and important question. Uh, on this question, if it's possible, I'd like to turn to my co-author, so Aaron Connolly, um, to speak more about what ASEAN can do and the role of great powers. Uh, thanks, Shona, and thanks, Lynn, uh, and thanks, Dr. Fitriani, for the question. Um, I think... The easy answer to this question is that the IISS does not take policy positions, and so we don't take a position on what ASEAN should do about the conflict. But the more complex answer, and perhaps a more thoughtful way to answer your question, is to say it depends upon what ASEAN member states want. And we've seen the mainland ASEAN member states, and in fact all of Myanmar's neighbors, China, uh, India, Bangladesh, Thailand, they all see their interests as being best served by helping the junta to establish control in the country. Um, and so their interests are different than those of the maritime countries uh, that see their interests as best served by penalizing the junta for its actions and seeking to use the leverage that it has over the junta by excluding it from ASEAN meetings, as we describe in our chapter, uh, as a way of coercing the junta into um, a more peaceful uh, path uh, but I think what we can say conclusively is that ASEAN can only be effective so long as it re is able to repeatedly come to consensus. And uh, despite the differences between the mainland and the maritime countries, we actually have seen ASEAN repeatedly come to consensus. So the decision to exclude Minang Klang uh, from the leaders' meeting was a consensus decision. The decision to uh, exclude the foreign minister from the foreign minister's meeting was a consensus decision. And so despite these differences, and I think this is the test of any multilateral organization, ASEAN has repeatedly come to consensus on Myanmar. Whether it can continue to do that, uh, despite India's very active diplomacy in support of uh, the junta's efforts to hold an election, for instance, and Chinese support of those efforts uh, in cooperation with ethnic armed groups on its border, uh, I think is a real challenge for ASEAN. And I, I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you, Aaron. And finally, Robert, please. Thank you, Lynn. Um, we're going to do an accelerated double header. So my, my, myself and my co-author, Yuka, so we're going to canter to the, to the end here together. Um, 
to Dimitri's question, um, I think just to clarify, the, the basic, I think Japan's basic position is that it wants to uh, straddle this sort of charybdis scylla relationship that it has with, uh, with China and the US, and, and you decide which is charybdis and which is scylla. Um, but it's a difficult one, like for many of the other countries uh, in, uh, in the region. Um, and I think the, uh, the new free and open Indo-Pacific concept that Kishida announced in, uh, in, in India the other day, that was sort of evidence that actually, despite all the strategic changes you're seeing in Japan, actually Japan still wants this constructive, inverted commas, relationship with, uh, with China. That said, um, the, I think with regard to the, to the US's uh, posture, I think Japan is, is more concerned um, about that the US might not respond if there was something untoward happening in the region. So Japan would like more US in the region rather than, um, rather than less. And I think that, if you, if you think of it in a different way, um, Japan has been, been perennially worried about two things, abandonment and con uh, uh, entrapment uh, with regard to its US relationship. I think now abandonment is trumping uh, in, entrapment within that, within those two things it's worried about. Uh, and, and why do I think that? Well, there's, if you look at um, the, the changes in Japan towards greater autom autonomy uh, in its defense uh, posture, its very aggressive building of uh, networks uh, in, the, in the national security strategy, it talked about these sort of multi-layered networks. They're really trying to sort of weave this network um, much more thickly within, within the region. Um, and also, of course, finally, um, it's, Japan is forlornly, I think, trying to keep the seat warm for the US in the CPTPP. Um, there is no likelihood, perhaps in my professional life, uh, that the US will rejoin the CPTPP, unfortunately. Uh, but Japan does, sort of, does continue to hold out hope that that will uh, change. So all of these things, I think, the, Japan is desperately trying to keep the US involved in the region because, because of its increasing uh, concerns about what might happen in it. Um, Okay. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, maybe because Robert um, answered on um, Japan's kind of strategic uh, strategic level, so maybe I'll make some comments on how Japan sees um, whether Japan's concern about U.S. military and defense. And approaches uh, to the potential Taiwan conflict. And I think from Japan's perspective, of course, there are some differences and assessments in terms of how likely that Taiwan contingency could be and maybe the potential timeline in that, that has been debated in Japanese security community as well. But I think for Japan, um, U.S. concern, high concern, especially after um, in March 2021 when Admiral Davidson said that it you know, potential invasion could happen in 2027. That was a very important signal um, in, 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 you know, a trigger in change in Japanese defense debates because, um, so shift in terms of, you know, helping Japan think differently to actually prepare for a potential conflict. And so in that sense, um, I think Japan also thinks that U.S. is right, asking the right questions, especially in terms of what it expects in, in terms of U.S.-Japan alliance operations, like questions like, you know, should Japan enhance cybersecurity so that U.S. can share intelligence um, for um, response capabilities? And also, should Japan enhance deterrence capabilities and shift um, from just ballistic missile defense into um, considering counterstrike capabilities um, so that Japan can shift into the integrated air and defense missile, you know, capabilities? Or should Japan, you know, have a have a joint um, permanent headquarter um, for the Japanese self-defense forces so that each branches can operate more cross domain? Japan should should Japan also um, invest more in space cyber and also so that U.S. and Japan could operate um, more corn. Uh, could take a coordinated approach, um, especially in intelligence gathering activities. And um, so, so, so in that sense, um, you know, as you know, like the, one of the also important changes in December 2022 was the change of the, uh, the name from National Defense uh, Procurement Guidelines, which was basically a defense buildup plan into a national defense strategy. So this is a signif historical significance from you know, a shift from what should we procure, what kind of capabilities should we, do we need, and, and a shift in discussion on how should the self-defense force operate. So that didn't happen until the 2021, I think, trigger. And, um, but also, um, I would also say that, um, you know, Japan, I think U.S.-Japan alliance is in a very 
um, it has been strengthened and their confidence, um, and the relationship has been at the best level. But under the Biden administration, which um, you know we focuses on cooperating with allies, so of course there are like lots of concerns about you know what might happen after the next presidential election and would this good relationship um, continue going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yuka. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so I apologize uh, to those of you who've um, indicated that you'd like to ask a question and weren't able to. Uh, it only leaves me to now thank um, the wonderful editorial team that Tim and I work with, um, London-based, Jack May, Nicholas Varga, Kelly Verity, and in Singapore, it's Rana Lawrence. Um, they've worked tremendously hard throughout the past year to deliver this publication as well as the graphics within it. Um, I'd also like to thank all the authors, um, as well as the speakers in the room today, as, and of course, everyone in the room, as well as those watching virtually. Thank you so much for your interest and your attention. Please do take a copy of the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment with you if you don't already have one. I hope you have an excellent and productive um, Shangri-La Dialogue weekend. Thank you.